Hi guys, welcome back to part three of my DIY tracker. In this video, I'm going to discuss the Arduino sketch that makes the whole thing work. But just a few notes before we begin. I've included a link in the description to the tracker's theory of operation. I'm sure it'll help you out greatly in understanding how the tracker works and how this code relates to it. I really think it's worth a quick read. Next up, I'm using Platform IO as my IDE to write, debug, and upload this sketch. It's an awesome plugin that works in conjunction with Visual Studio Code, aka VS Code, and I highly recommend trying it at some point if you haven't already. Its abilities are way above and beyond the Arduino IDE, and you can even import your Arduino sketches directly into it. Platform IO looks a little confusing at the beginning, and it isn't as forgiving as the Arduino IDE. It's a little more strict with the structure of your code. And you'll notice if you look at this uh, video here, you'll see that all of the functions that you use must have been previously declared before you can use them. That means that the functions will be at the top of your sketch just after the inclusions and the definitions of your global variables and so on. As an amateur coder, I'll be the first guy to admit that there's no doubt a great number of things that could be improved or done differently. And I hope you'll excuse them and also my failure to uh, follow some of the more traditional programming uh, best practices, for now at least, as I'm still learning too. I've included a link to this sketch in the description below and I invite you guys to contribute your ideas and thoughts on how we can make this project better. That'd be appreciated. So let's get started. Okay, first I want to say that it is highly unlikely that this sketch will work with your tracker and at the location you're using it at. There's a number of definitions that I've highlighted here with red dots that you'll need to change and or verify before you can safely use your tracker. So these definitions here, 22 to 27, all kind of interact with each other. And uh, it might be a little confusing to try to understand it, but I'll do my best to explain it. I'm just going to read from my notes here, so sorry if it sounds a little bit robotic, but uh, here we go. You'll need to set up your tracker's minimum and maximum mechanical travel in magnetic degrees in lines 22 and 23. Lines 26 and 27 set the minimum and maximum counts for the azimuth position and are used as a safety stop. They limit the travel of the tracker in case of miscounts or drive chain breakage and eventually I'm going to be installing uh, over travel sensors just to simplify the process. The azimuth at zero count on line number 24 needs to be set to calibrate the magnetic heading as it relates to the counter. The degrees per revolution on line 35 also needs to be set depending upon the uh, total reduction of your azimuth drive. I have future plans to simplify this whole process uh, using an inertial measuring unit like an IMU9050 uh, that includes a magnetic heading, but I've been having some problems trying to get stable readings from it, so it's going to be on the back burner for now. There are similar setups for the elevation definitions. However, their readings are from an analog to digital converter that reads the linear actuator's feedback potentiometer. You'll need to set up these definitions for the actuator that you're actually using. This will also be simplified in the future using either an electronic level module or maybe the IMU 9050 if I can get it working. Lines 52 and 53 set the minimum and maximum mechanical travel of your elevation. The storm and safe values on line 54 and 55 should also be checked against your setup. To get human readable angles in degrees, you'll need to set up the elevation ADC mapping values on lines 64 to 67. Summer and winter home elevation values should be set up uh, to your preference on lines 69 and 70. Lines 114 to 118 
determine how the sun's current position is calculated. Note that the sunset elevation on line 118 must be lower than the sunrise value. And finally, on line 131, you'll need to set your standard time zone. I've included code to automatically adjust the local time for daylight savings time. It's important to note that the time setting for the real-time clock is in UTC, Universal Coordinated Time, and not in local time. Okay, so let's have a look at the primary parts of the main loop. Most of the code is heavily commented and uh, should be relatively self-explanatory. In this first section, lines 1585 to 1615, we're looking at the code for a simple manual control. I used this when I was first testing and calibrating the movements of the two axes. The inputs are physically wired to the Mega's analog inputs, but set for digital I.O. use. I had intended to eventually use a joystick, but I found myself pretty much always using the uh, uh, jog command instead. So there's nothing really special here. I forgot to mention that all commands except manual movement are issued by way of a serial Bluetooth app on your mobile phone. You can always type help to see what all the commands are. I'll leave a link below to the app in the Google Play Store. I don't know if there's any equivalent versions for iPhone or not. The section for automatic movement is lines 1618 to 1746. On line 1623, we ask the calculate sun position function to return the azimuth in magnetic degrees and the elevation in degrees above the horizon into global variables calculated azim TOD and calculated elevation TOD. The calculated elevation TOD variable is mapped to calculated elevation ADC to make it easier for us to read and work with. FYI, all automatic moves and jog requests are handled using the ASM auto move and elevation auto move functions as instructed by this code or either of the jog commands. The automatic section consists of two main parts, the first being when the sun is in our view of the sky and the second when it is not. At the beginning of daytime operation, lines 1630 to 1642, there's a provision for aligning the PV array to the sun's position when you first put the tracker into automatic mode. After that is the regular daytime operation, lines 1643 to 1666. This part determines when the tracker should move. Azimuth and elevation movements are independent from each other and one may make several movements before the other needs to. There are a number of parameters you can adjust to fine-tune these movements to your liking. You will need to be careful though that your movement windows don't become too small or you may get unpredictable results. The second part operates after sunset. The tracker will move to the home position you set as shown in lines 1670 to 1686. In the morning, lines 1688 to 1735 will move the tracker's axes to meet the sun's position or to the furthest counterclockwise and or down positions as limited by their respective parameters. Lines 1737 to 1743 allow the elevation to track the sun when it's above the sunrise setting and the azimuth is less than the full counterclockwise position. There's no similar provision for the sunset at this time. The rest of the sketch's main loop from line 1756 to the end handles the serial communication for receiving commands from the Bluetooth module. All commands are in plain text as sent by the app and are separated into those that have no parameters and to those that have one or more. Hey guys, you know, there's over 2,100 lines of code in this sketch and 69 functions. And I have to apologize, but I just don't have the time to cover them all. So I hope that uh, you can download the sketch and have a good look at it yourself. And I hope that this gets you started.
And uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for joining me.